talking to the guys before we uh, before we started. I, I am not a sports economist. Um, I'm not even a sports betting economist, really. I'm a macro economist, and I owe my interest in this topic that we're presenting here today to my co-author, Tyg Haggerty, who is also on the call. Um, Tyg uh, is a recent PhD graduate of UCD, um, but is also uh, 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 has experience as a professional bookmaker. Um, so I, I have every so often I tell jokes about our research collaboration that start with you know an economist and a bookmaker uh, walks into a go walk into a bar you know what happens, but it, it's not really fair. It's Tiger's Tiger's an economist and a bookmaker. Um, so so the expertise here uh, in terms of this collaboration is pretty much everything that's specific to about bookmaking and bookmaking markets is 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 from Tig and I'm bringing uh, some 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 uh, uh, sort of theoretical uh, uh, insights um, to 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 bear. Um, so that's that's the collaboration. Let me check now that the slides are moving. Is that uh, you can see the first slide that says traditional literature? Yeah, we can see it all. Great. So look, this is a sort of throw clearing slide that probably isn't particularly necessary for this uh, audience who know indeed that there is a large literature on uh, sports betting. Um, uh, and, and, you know, this is normally the appeal to a general audience is 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 that it's seen as a sort of a, a natural laboratory for seeing how people take risky decisions under uncertainty. Um, I, I tried to push back a, on that in a little and in in the sense that I would argue that the explosive growth in online betting um, over the past number of years means that this is this is a substantive industry in and of itself worth understanding uh, uh, given the scale of of activity in it. Um, there's a long literature going back to you know the famous Griffith paper um, from 1946 um, demonstrating um, that there's a favorite long shot bias in betting odds. And this is probably a literature that seems to, seems to have been largely dominated by US economists, and their focus was on paramutual uh, uh, racetrack betting, um, because that was the only way that you could bet on, uh, the only legal way outside Vegas and New Jersey, wherever, that you could bet on, uh, uh, bet on horses. So there's a lot of papers on, on what drives the favorite long shot bias. And, Within paramutual betting, the implicit odds that you end up getting depend on the volumes. Um, uh, so if you're going to explain a pattern of favorite long shot bias, the explanation doesn't come from the paramutual operator who just takes a slice of the take. It has to come from the behavior of the bettors themselves. Um, so, so explanations are things like people are not good at judging low probability outcomes and think uh, long shots are more likely to win than they are, or perhaps people really like betting on long shots. Perhaps there's a bunch of kind of random bettors that equally bet on favorites and long shots, which overweights volumes on on um, uh, on long shots. I, I, I'm not going to um, focus on on which of these explanations I, I think I think work, but what I will say is that. We're not interested in paramutual betting. We're interested in fixed odds betting. Right? Modern online uh, uh, sports betting is uh, um, features odds that are set by bookmakers, um, and uh, I think there's perhaps been too much focus in the fixed odds literature on the kinds of explanations that work for sure in paramutual betting without thinking about whether those explanations would work within a fixed odds uh, uh, betting market setting. Um, and so partly what we're, we're here to do is to, is to uh, try to provide uh, um, models of the, of the market structure of a fixed odds betting and then see whether or not certain explanations work uh, or not. And of course, this is of interest because um, fixed odds betting the research on favorite long shot bias has uh, in many cases found uh, favorite long shot bias also in fixed odds uh, uh, betting markets, um, although not all. And one of the, piece, the pieces of evidence that we'll present here is to show that in, in European soccer, um, you can find fixed uh, favorite long shot bias in home away draw uh, uh, betting, which is the traditional way to bet on, on soccer, um, but not in the um, 
for the equivalent data set for the, uh, the Asian handicap market. And I will the, the classical you know way to uh, um, present your research is to imagine that you sat down and came up with a theory and you hypothesize you know h zero and then you and then you went and collected data. And I will very happily say because it's easily verifiable from our, uh, my 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 web page timeline that that is not how this paper was written. So, so Tig and I have already written our paper about how there's favored long shot bias in the home away draw market and not in the Asian handicap market. So this very much came from us, me in particular, I guess, kind of kicking the tires of that result and trying to say, well, why would this be? Um, and so, um, so we've got a, a, a model that we think explains a number of features um of fixed odds betting, odd betting markets and we'll come around at the end and it'll be no coincidence that then at the end that the evidence is going to support uh is going to support the theory um the key features of the model uh, that we're going to present um is we are not going to motivate um favorite long shot bias in soccer betting markets as being on the basis of any specific sort of non-standard set of preferences. So our, our, our betters are just going to be risk neutral. They're not going to be risk lovers. They won't be people that systematically fail to judge uh, uh, small probabilities. Um, they're, they're, they're just going to be a bunch of guys that disagree about the probabilities of outcomes. And I think that's a pretty weak starting assumption since it's really hard to imagine betting markets in which some people pick one side at the odds and some people pick the other side at the at the prevailing odds um, and imagine that they don't somehow disagree uh, about what the likely outcomes are. So that's we're, we're going to show that you can generate from uh, a, a pretty standard setting um, uh, that you can generate favorite long shot bias simply from the assumption that people people disagree about the relevant probabilities. As I alluded to before, um, the market structure is really important. If you're looking at prices, it's very important to know how the price is generated. And so we're going to consider two pricing structures, one a, a pure competitive market, and in the other, we're going to model a, 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 a monopolistic market. We know in the real world that, that there is no monopoly bookmaker in countries for for sports betting um but but we're going to argue that uh the market structure uh for most retail european betting is n certainly not as competitive as it looks um so the key here is not really that that the, that the bookmakers are monopolists but certainly that but that they have some market power okay and so if they have some market power what matters for price setting is price elasticity of demand OK, and we're going to should demonstrate a result that uh, when you have disagreement about the underlying probabilities, that it, it turns out that that demands for uh, long shots is uh, uh, um, um, less price elasticity than demand than demand for favorites. OK, um, and you, you want the bookmakers, you want anybody selling you anything to believe that you are highly price elastic. That gets you a better deal. OK, bookmakers do not believe that people who want to bet on long shots are, are highly price elastic and as a result, they get a worse deal. I want to flag early then as well. Another interesting feature of what we get is. Even if you went along with this explanation for favorite long shot bias, that it's got something to do with price elasticity, I mean, it could well just be that there are other kind of non-rational reasons for this like it could be that people who want to bet on long shots are just you know they 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 love the thrill of the long shots so much that that's what makes them not be very price elastic um and so that's that 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 would be kind of unobserv you know observably the same uh, as our explanation about disagreement so we end up using uh, uh developing a model for soccer betting where there's a there can be a win uh, a, a team can win, lose, or draw. So there's three outcomes. And the model ends up generating a very specific uh, prediction for the behavior of, of the odds on draws. And uh, uh, um, one of my fun moments in this project was the Eureka moment when 
uh, to my great surprise, the data actually seemed to verify this prediction. Uh, it doesn't happen in macro, I'll tell you that. Um, so, so that's that's the, that's that's the model, and that's what we're at. The application will be a data set that is familiar uh, to to most of you. It's the standard football data uh, 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 data set uh, put together by by Joe uh, Buchdahl. So we have. Um, we'll show you the data set later, but it's about eighty thousand. Uh, uh, soccer matches, and um, we're going to argue that we think the Asian handicap market looks more like a competitive market, and that the competitive market doesn't feature favored long shot bias. And we're going to argue that the, the the more traditional retail market for home away and draw bets looks more like a monopolistic market, which should have favored long shot bias. So that we you know already because I've given the game away that we know that's true in the data, but we're going to try and verify other very specific predictions about the pattern of the bias um, and the specific pattern that we that it predicts for draws. OK. Now would probably be a good time if anyone wants to do a sort of a, a roadmap kind of question or if anybody's uh, urgent to say something. Um, OK. So. I'll start with. With, with just the simplest possible model of what a competitive uh, 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 bookmaking market might look like with risk neutral investors. So suppose there's an event and there's n possible outcomes and each have a probability PI. And in all cases, we're going to assume our bookmakers know those probabilities. Um, I don't think that makes that much difference. We can have that they have some estimate of it and it's as long as it's, I think as long as it's unbiased, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. We're going to use decimal odds throughout, so uh, the odds are going to be they're going to offer odds O sub I, uh, so that if the if a one dollar bet wins, you get O uh, sub I back if that event happens. And the way we're going to define uh, uh, the competitive market is that each firm expects to make a, a profit rate of of theta on each bet. Right, so it's a, it's it's not a competitive market. It's not just a competitive market in the aggregate. It's a competitive market on each bet that's placed. On each bookmaker expects to make a certain return from running a book on a specific bet. Uh, we we'll write down here that the bookmakers have a, a, a costs uh, that are a certain fraction mu of the total amount of bets. It's not strictly necessary for this model, but we it's a feature we use in the in the monopolistic version of the model for for for, for realism. Um, so. Um, to make the uh, 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 profit rate of theta, that means on each bet that you've got to have the, the one dollar that's put down minus the cost minus the expected payout that you have to equal uh, this, this theta, which is this required rate of return. So that generates uh, uh, odds so that the odds are just um, not the inverse of the probabilities. The inverse of the probabilities adjusted for that the bookmaker needs to cover costs and make a profit. Um, so in our version of a competitive market, that that's the odds. Now note all of the things that this rules that this rules out. Um, it rules out anything to do with betters, preferences, or uh, uh, behavioral features. So, um, for example, you may have betters that love risk. Um, uh, you may have betters that misjudge probabilities on uh, uh, long shots, um, but that wouldn't uh, affect the odds. And the, the theoretical counterfactual here is um, if you have betters who misjudge probabilities and therefore are willing to make bad bets that are that that are more profitable than other bets, the profit rate is theta. In a competitive market, somebody's going to come in and offer those guys better odds, right? So. Uh, um, Somebody might love risk, and or somebody may misjudge probabilities, or have some irrational love of a particular team. They may just always bet a Manchester United, no bad, no, no matter how bad they are. Um, and so they may be irrational in that sense. The only rationality we need from betters is that betters can go on, you know, odds checker or something, and and can can say, oh, I'm going to take the most generous odds. Um, so I've struggled a bit a couple of times. We've had some of this work refereed. With referees who 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 kind of insist that um, that 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 the favorite long shot bias can just structurally has to reflect uh, um, the preferences of betters, but at least with this simple example, it shows that it it doesn't it that that doesn't have to be the case. Um, 
So that's our version of, of a competitive market. Uh, and there's no favored long shot bias. The average loss for each bet is mu plus theta. Uh, and if you collected data from such a market, you wouldn't see uh, returns differing in any way across the different kinds of bets. Okay, so, so the betters don't matter for that model. The betters only matter and how betters behave only matter uh, in our paper for the monopoly version of the model. So we're going to assume, uh, we'll start with the general version of this and then I'll give some specific versions. So let's stick with that there's n possible outcomes and there's a probability p sub i that outcome i uh, occurs. Um, we're going to have a continuum of betters of size one and they can either choose to bet or not bet. When they bet, they place equal size bets and we normalize this to one. Um, now that sweeps aside a very large part of the potential theoretical literature on gambling. So we, our betters won't be using the Kelly criterion or any of these kind of things to bet. If hopefully at the end, we might get a bit more chance to talk about how these results might generalize if we started to endogenize uh, uh, bet size. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that aside uh, for now. We'll just say there's a standard normalized bet size. The, the potential betters, they have subjective beliefs uh, about this PI that we, we call P tilde I, and they're randomly assigned, and there's a random, there's a distribution function in terms of those assignments. So we'll call that distribution function F, that's the CDF. We're going to assume that on average, the betters are correct about this probability. Okay. Um, we, we could introduce biases of, of various sorts and still get quite a lot of our results. So it's more a baseline. Um, so this follows on from, uh, the, there's a famous paper by, by, by uh, Ali from 1977, and, and Ali shows that in the context of paramutual betting, uh, this set of assumptions, people disagree, but on average they're right, that's enough to generate favorite long shot bias in paramutual markets. Now, that doesn't generate favorite long shot bias in our version of the competitive market. People can disagree all they want. That doesn't impact the odds. Uh, but here with our monopolist, it turns out that is going to generate favorite long shot bias in a monopoly fixed odds uh, uh, market. Uh, all the examples that we do, we're going to assume that beliefs are symmetrically distributed um, around this uh, level. Again, you could generalize things a bit with some asymmetries, um, but it keeps things simpler. And, and our betters are very simple people. They're risk neutral. And they bet if their subjective perceived uh, 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 return on a one dollar bet um, is greater than one dollar. Okay, that's 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 a very simple decision rule. So faced with a bunch of betters of this type, um, what does our bookmaker do? We're going to assume a risk neutral bookmaker. Uh, again, we're going to assume they know the underlying probabilities pi. Um, and they're aware of the demand function for bets. Obviously, the rule says you're more likely to place a bet the higher the odds are. So they, they know what that what that demand function is. And so the bookmaker has a, a, an expected profit um, for bets that that I will happen of this. So this is the, the revenue from taking the bet. Uh, this is the cost from the administrative cost that we've held over from the other model. And this is the expected uh, payout uh, of the bookmaker. So from this, we can go through and derive what the optimal odds are. And in particular, we can derive this nice expression for the optimal odds, uh, which are that the optimal odds are what I call here a markdown on the odds that a zero profit competitive uh, a bookmaker would set. Uh, and the size of the markdown, this is the standard formula from microeconomics, the size of the markdown depends upon the elasticity uh, of demand. If you call the, if you imagine the price just to be the inverse of the odds, you have the standard result in microeconomics of monopoly, of, of, of imperfectly competitive prices being a mark up on competitive prices. Uh, I would love to say that I invented this result. I did not. Uh, I found this in a lovely paper in Gibo uh, uh, by Maurizio uh, uh, Montone. And if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend it. Um, so from that framework, we kind of know what's going to set prices. This is the result of a price elasticity of demand uh, being the key things that key thing that matters. And so this is the bit where I'm going to tell you that uh, people who bet on favorites are more sensitive to the odds than people who bet on 
uh, 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 people who've been on long shots. Now, we're going to work through, we'll ha we have in the paper algebraic examples of this, where we plug in demand functions and we take derivatives and all that sort of thing. You'll see that in a minute, okay? But this is a concept that can be explained. You know, this is not how I would explain it to my grandmother. Right. So uh, let me give you this sort of num number, sort of finger exercise as to get an intuition as to why this why this result holds. So suppose we have a, uh, a an event and, and the probability there's two competitors and the favorite is 70 percent likely to win. Uh, betters have random beliefs about that. Um, that in this example, we've, we've, we, we have that the beliefs go uh, to a low of that some people think it's not 70%, some people think it's 60%, and then they go up to a high that some people think it, that it's not 60%, that it's 70%, that it's 80%. Um, so let's get, let's set OF and OL to be the decimal odds that are offered on the favorite and the long shot. And let's just start with um, thinking about what the fair odds would be in this situation. Okay, so fair odds would be that the all the betters exactly break even on average. So so the fair odds for the favorite here would be 1.43. The fair odds for the long shot would be 3.33. Okay. Now, what res what results in, in, in the monopoly bookmaker being able to squeeze as much profit out of people as possible is there are people out there with incorrect beliefs that are too optimistic about their bet. And what we're going to show you here is that the people who who are have the misfortune to be particularly optimistic about the long shot, they're willing to take particularly bad odds. Right? So in this case, if we work through it, consider the favorite. There's somebody out there at the, at the extreme and he thinks that P is 0.8. So he his decision rule would have him take the bet as long as the odds are at least 1.25. Right? Now 1.25, that's one eighth lower than the fair odds. Okay. Coincidentally, it means they will lose one eighth of their money on average if these are the odds. Um, but then we take the guy who's optimistic about the long shot. So this guy thinks P tilde is 0. 0.6. So he thinks the probability of the long shot winning is 0. 0.4. And they'll accept odds on the long shot of 1 over 0. 0.4, which is 2.5. Now, 2.5 is a quarter lower than 3.33. So they'll lose a quarter of their money. So that's the intuition. Um, we have specific distributions of beliefs that we that that that, that we put in, um, but 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 that's the sort of building block for why it is that the people who are are are, are betting on long shots um, have a different elasticity. Here is uh, a little bit more science on this. This shows demand functions for. Uh, um, very specifications of the distribution, the cross-sectional distribution of beliefs. So we mainly use uniform distributions in this paper. So in this case, we've got four different values for the probability of a, a, a competitor winning, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And in each case, we say that beliefs are uniform on, down, on, on, on P down to 0 0.2, minus 0 0.2, and then plus 0 0.2. And then we literally go and trace out what fraction of the betters will take the uh, uh, the bet at various odds, okay, and and what we see is if p is 0 0.8, there's a very very narrow range of odds that people will accept. At the odds under this, nobody takes the 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 bet, and at odds above this, everybody takes the bet. But if we look at p equals 0.2, so somebody's betting on a, a real underdog, we see that there's a lot more sort of curvature here, um, you know. So it's sort of trying to build some intuition to this as to why, uh, you know, if we look at, at odds, decimal odds of 10, so you have to think that P is at least 0.1 for that, but we still got about a quarter of our betters that haven't taken that bet because at 0.2, our uniform distribution now goes from 0 to 0.4. So there's about a quarter of the betters think it's lower than 0.1 and haven't taken up the bet. So um, what's going to matter for us is not so much these 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 high end bits in terms of what happens when they offer very generous odds. What matters for us is is what happens if they offer odds that increasingly are not generous. And what we see for favorites, if you start to offer odds that are not generous, you quickly lose all your betters. And that's not the case when you're offering odds on uh, uh, long shots. Um, 
just to clarify, there's nothing special about the uniform distribution here. Any reasonable specification of, of, of the distribution gives, gives this. So here's a normal distribution, and this has been calibrated. So it's normal, but it has the same variance as the, 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 the uniform distribution case. And of course, you don't get the sharp sort of zero, one, nobody bets, and then or everybody bets. It's more smooth, but, but, but the, the point is basically the same. So to give our specific example, um, if you had a uniform distribution of beliefs and the, the uses parameter sigma i, and the sigma i tells us how much disagreement there is. So it's symmetric disagreement uh, uh, above and below the, the true probability. Um, the demand function for bets um, is actually not quite as simple as this. The demand function for bets is if the odds are too low, you get no bets, demand is zero. If the odds are too high, everybody takes it. In, in the intermediate zone where it's between zero and one, this formula uh, 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 working from the CDF of the uniform distribution tells you how many people bet. You can plug that into the model, figure out the elasticity of demand, and you end up with this as the, as the, as the decimal odds. Um, plugging in some numbers, you get to see that this predicts uh, a, a, a pattern of favorite long shot bias that depends upon uh, how much disagreement there is. Okay, if we go and set this sigma I equal to zero, we're going to end up with as a square root formula here, and we got we'll have pi squared on the bottom. So we'll end up back with that the odds are inversely proportional to the probability. So there's no favorite long shot bias. So the more disagreement there is, the bigger the favorite long shot bias. Um, if you plug in some numbers. Was we take an event that's 80% likely to happen, set the cost parameter equal to zero, set the sigma i equal to 0.1. Then in that case, the competitive uh, uh, zero profit odds will be 1.25. Uh, the monopolist will set odds of 1.18. So for that favor type event, uh, uh, type outcome, the, 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 the monopolist sets odds that are 6% worse. But if you plug in 0.2, we can go through and do the same sums, and we see that it's it's 18% worse. Um, so we can illustrate that with here's a chart that shows competitive odds and then the corresponding uh, uh, monopoly odds for uh, varying the probability of a bet winning from 0.1 to to 0.9. Um, and what we can see is is the monopoly the monopolist charges. Uh, uh, ends up setting odds that are lower than the corresponding competitive uh, uh, um, uh, um, bookmaker. We have to set some parameters here. We've set the, the cost equal to 0 0.02. And we've set the disagreement here to equal to 0 0.06. But this sort of characteristic sort of uh, 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 shape of the odds is is robust to any of the parameters that we pick. Um, we can see that it, it's a little bit hard to see here. I'll, the next chart will, will explain this better. But it turns out the percentage uh, 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 difference between these two, two lines is increasing. Uh, and we can demonstrate that from looking at the loss rates. So the loss rates, the expected loss rates for betters taking bets at these odds um, go from about 0.04 and then non-linearly increase so that the, the more, the, the, the less likely the bet is to win, the, the bigger the losses are. Um, I will note that it, it, here it looks like the orange and blue lines are really just on top of each other. Um, but but in fact, the, the difference, it's just that differences here look really small relative to differences up here. So in fact, this is a market where uh, um, uh, we would have a 2% loss for um, for uh, uh, the, in the competitive case, and it's it's 4% for um for uh, for the monopolistic market, so even for even for favorites, having your bookmaking market dominated by a monopolist by a monopolist is not good for outcomes. Okay, but this characteristic sort of nonlinear shape is is something that we're gonna we're gonna look for in the data. Um, now, the, the, the eagle-eyed might have noticed that if you have n different possible outcomes, um, you can't have all of them. I can't have the beliefs for all of them just be uniformly distributed. There has to be some, uh, the public presumably understands that the sum of the probabilities equal one. Okay, so if I know n minus one, if I specify my distribution for n minus one of the probabilities, then the nth uh, uh, must just be one minus those. Okay, so um, 
So we'll show how, how we deal with that. If there's two outcomes, then there's basically only one free probability. If you, the probability that the favorite winning is P, then the probability of the, the long shot winning is one minus P. So we can immediately go and figure out the ratio of odds for favorites and long shots from, from that. And we get this nice, if you remember, we had a square root formula here and they both have one minus mu on the on the numerator. So we get this nice formula for the ratio of uh, 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 favorite odds to long shot odds. And we can plug in our numbers here and see what the favorite long shot bias is in this case. And it all depends upon this sigma. And the sigma is common across both the favorite and the long shot because the, the, the disagreement about one translates into disagreement about the other. Now, those of you who know this uh, literature well will we'll recognize that this is similar to a formula from Shin's famous 1991 paper where there's a square root uh, formula for the ratio of favorite odds to long shot odds. And there's good reasons for that. Um, essentially, this is the Shin model of monopoly bookmaking, but it's got two crucial differences. So the first is a Shin's model contains a bunch of insiders who know the result. Uh, and separately, I've been doing some work about about insiders and whether those stories are, are are useful. We don't have any insiders, okay? So that's not what drives uh, uh, the favorite long shot bias. And 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 Shin's betters had had, had different beliefs. So in Shin's paper, the the betters had uniform beliefs over zero to one. Effectively, the effectively the betters didn't know anything, right? They just had randomly assigned numbers. So you know, if, if Liverpool were playing uh, uh, Sheffield United tomorrow, they would just they just as happily pick Sheffield United as Liverpool. So we discussed this in the paper. We don't think that's particularly realistic. And a more reasonable baseline is that the public are at least on average, uh, uh, at least in the ballpark, uh, in their assessment of of probabilities. Um, so that's the that's two outcomes. Our empirical application is soccer, and soccer has three outcomes, and we we struggled with this for a little bit. Um, once we set two of these probabilities that people hold subjectively, then the third one is done. So 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 how how to, how did we decide to do this? So if you go and take a look at our data, there is a bit of um, sports betting lore that I've kind of come across, which is that draws are hard to predict, and. That that's true in the sense of it's hard to run a regression model and get a high R squared for predicting a draw. But on the other hand, um, it, it turns out with a large enough data set, predicting the fraction of games that will end in a draw is actually not hard. Um, so here's our data set with the 80,000 matches. And what we've done here is we have uh, sorted the, the 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 data set by the ex ante probability from the odds that the favorite wins. So this is the standard normalized probability. So as we go left to right, uh, we're moving from you know pure toss ups to you know Manchester City play Sheffield United. Okay, where there's 70, 80 percent chance that the favorite's going to win. And literally all we're doing here is we're sorting what fraction of the, the the time did we get the other possible results? What fraction of the time did we get uh, uh, draws? What fraction of the time did we get wins? And we see there's this pattern of the more likely the favorite is to win, the less likely there is to be a draw, and the less likely it is that the long shot wins. But, and this is just sort of random that this thing turned out to be such a nice shape. Um, this is the ratio of uh, 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 draws to long shot wins. So effectively, it turns out there's like a linear pattern. So that as the favorite becomes more likely to win, the game is more likely to end up in a draw than it is in a long shot win. That makes sense, right? If, if not the, that it's a linear shape, but you know, if Manchester City playing Sheffield United, the game most likely City are going to win. What's the next likely outcome? It's probably not going to be the Sheffield United. Will, can win. They go into it thinking probably the best we can do is a draw. So that turns out to be right. Draws become more likely relative to long shots. Um, and, and that pattern just turns out to, to just fit quite well in terms of like the, the R squared from a, a straight linear regression on this is quite high. So, so, so what we've done with our calibration of how people believe is we continue to have people disagreeing about the probability that the favorite wins. 
um, and there's our the continues to be uniform distributions and there's this disagreement parameter. But we then have them take uh, positions in terms of the probability of a draw and the probability of a long shot win that are then consistent with those patterns. So these are the data and we're kind of assuming our people know these data or, or, or formulate probabilities in a manner that's consistent with those data. OK. Now, armed with that, we are able to uh, calculate the odds that the bookmaker will set. Um, and here's the promised funny result about draws um, that we get in the uh, in, 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 from from doing that. So. This shows the true probability of the bet winning, OK? So um, out here, we're looking at bets on favorites, and there's bets on favorites that are very, very likely to win. In here, we're looking at bets on long shots, which are very unlikely to win. Bets on draws have a much narrower range. The bet, the bet on the draws is 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 you know, rarely likely to ever be um, sixty percent that it's going to be a, that the draw is going to win. So it's a much narrower range. And if we ignored the draw, we basically get the same pattern as before. There's this funny little jump down from the blue line to the yellow line, but effectively we get this sort of nonlinear pattern uh, as we go from bets on favorites to to bets on on long shots. But then, then we get the draw, and through this range here, uh, losses for people betting on draws are lower than for people betting on long shots, even when the underlying probability of the bet succeeding is the same. Um, then we get a, an area here when uh, when the draw is more likely to lose you money than. Uh, uh, um, down the long shot. So, so this is a very specific and sort of nuanced prediction, and it's coming from the assumptions about disagreement. So what drives this is, uh, this is the assumed amount of disagreement in the model. So for this calibration that we did here, we had we continued to set the, the sigma equal to 0.06. So that means what we're measuring disagreement here now is measured as the gap between the bottom guy's belief and the top guy's belief, right? So that's 0.012 then if sigma is 0.06. And we're keeping that fixed for the favorite in this example. Um, but what happens is when the favorite is not that strong a favorite, most of the disagreement is, is about whether or not the, there's more disagreement about the long shot uh, winning than there is about the draw. Um, and one reason for that is if I, let's say we say Manchester United play, playing Liverpool, okay, and maybe it's one third, one third, one third of the true probabilities, okay, but I'm a Liverpool enthusiast and I think Liverpool are more likely to win. Um, so I think the true probability of Liverpool winning is, you know, 60%. In that case, I don't think it's, I think a draw is unlikely because my preferred team, I think, is going to win. Now, there's a guy out there who disagrees with me. He loves Man United, and he thinks Man United are probability 0.6. We disagree about that, but we don't disagree that much about the draw. OK, now it only flips when we get to when we get to uh, 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 the true probability of the favorite winning being very high. Um, at that point, since the, the everybody basically then agrees the long shots very unlikely to win, and so when we start disagreeing about the probability of the favorite winning, the other outcome we start to, to think it, it's going to be is not the long shot winning, but it's the draw. So if I disagree, if you say I'm really confident Manchester City are going to win, and I say I'm not as confident that Manchester City are going to win, really what we're disagreeing about there now is the draw. OK, so um, so in general, there's less disagreement about draws, and so there should be better bets. But in some cases, more of the disagreement is about draws. OK. Anybody got any question about that? Because it's kind of it's kind of nuanced. OK. So our application, we already, I've already told you what the data set is. It's the it's the football data data set, 84,000 uh, matches. Um, and we're going to look at both the, 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 the average uh, uh, odds for uh, betting on the home away or draw uh, outcome and the average odds from the Asian handicap uh, outcome. Okay, so 
so most people know the Asian handicap, uh, you're not betting on the match itself. You're betting on an adjusted scoreline where a handicap has been given added to the to to the weaker team. Um, and in terms of the two market structures that we've talked about, our argument is that the Asian handicap market looks more like a competitive one, and the home away draw market looks more like a monopolistic one. Right. So we know that 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 most of the sort of retail betting that people are doing um, um, with the, the traditional bettors is, is taking bets on home, away, or draw. Um, and we know the structure of that market is very different from the structure of the market uh, uh, that dominates the Asian handicap, uh, uh, Asian handicap betting. Um, you know, traditional high street bookmakers, the so-called soft bookmakers, um, uh, tend to have quite high profit margins per bet. They, they manage risks very carefully, they place limits on how much people can bet, and we know the people who are serial winners or who seem to be informed or keep taking up, you know, uh, uh, um, best odds price opportunities, they get, get they get limited and then maybe eventually banned. Um, so these are clearly restrictions on free market functioning, and. I'd say one, one point that Ty could maybe comment on a little bit more more later, but we know, for instance, things like odds checker, which make it look as though there's an appearance of competition. I, I can go in for any event and I can see who has the best odds. If I actually click into that uh, best odds and try to take it, you'll probably say, OK, 20 pounds. And if I turn up every day and I keep taking the best odds, it won't tell me 20 pounds, it'll tell me 10 pounds and eventually they'll tell me to go away. Um, so, so th there's, there's an appearance of competition, but the competition is not not that real. I would note also that most of the advertising that these guys do is focused on, you know, the experience, the Ladbrokes life, you know, the thrill of betting, blah, blah, blah. And very little is on, well, actually, we had the best price on the Liverpool Man United game. So in contrast, uh, all those things are, you know, multiplied by minus one for sharp bookmakers who dominate the Asian handicap market. So they have low margins. Uh, the very existence, the very fact that margins are reasonably high in retail bookmaking in Europe is in and of itself an indication of a market that's not very competitive, right? Because if they were cutthroat in their competition, we would see uh, the profit margins be lower. And if you look through the accounts of uh, uh, Flutter, for instance, you can see that, that their profitability rates are quite high. Um, so, uh, uh, but but the Asian handicap, we can see from the margins, the average margins that they're quite that they're quite low, and that that's consistent with uh, with them being competitive. Um, they don't seem to worry about risk nearly as much as as as, as the, the 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 home away draw uh, uh, market or the the, the soft bookmakers. Um, they don't place limits on bets. Um, and they, they're very popular with professional betters uh, uh, and, 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 and consortiums. Now, of course, if you went to these guys, if you go to the sharp bookmakers, they'll, they'll offer you odds on just to win, to win home away or win. Um, and of course, you can find Asian handicap odds with, you know, Paddy Power, for example. But but largely, the, the, the markets seem to be dominated. The home away draw is largely dominated by the uh, the the soft traditional bookmakers and the Asian handicap by the by the sharp bookmakers. So anyway, that's our that's our our our, our idea of mapping our, our theoretical models onto practical examples. So we've got twenty two leagues uh, and the data sets. So we've got five from England, four from Scotland, and so on, and these other other countries. So this is what Joe uh, makes available. So a recap on what the models predict. Accepting our mapping of uh, 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 theoretical market structures onto these practical examples, we should expect to see favorite long shot bias in the home away draw market, and we shouldn't expect to see it in the Asian handicap market. We just should expect the pattern of, of favorite long shot bias that we see in home away draw betting to be highly nonlinear with loss rates growing as the probability of winning drops. Um, and then we should expect this pattern with draws that draws will somet sometimes be the better bet. Um, but then sometimes will 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 be a worse bet. Okay, um, so basically, when draws are more probable, uh, um, they're a, they're a better bet, uh, uh, and when draws are least probable, uh, they're a worse bet. Um, so, 
Uh, here's the whole data set, all of the bets on, on, on all three types of matches put together, and we immediately see this nonlinear pattern. So th th this is the, the first thing that we did essentially to try to match, uh, uh, essentially to try to match this picture. OK, um, and for a while I was happy with that. That was going to be the evidence. Uh, and then I remembered that this picture is based on two outcomes and soccer has three outcomes. Um, so that's the nonlinear pattern, you know, on average in the data set. Here is the data's attempt to match this chart, OK, uh, of loss rates on favorites, long shots and the draw. Um, and um, I mean, as empirical economics go, this 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 does okay, right? It it, it the the basic qualitative features of the model um, that 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 you should have higher loss rates uh, uh, as the probability of the bet winning goes down, uh, that it should be sort of nonlinear. Even that little jump going from the blue line down to the green line is actually in the theory. Um, uh, I'm, I, even I couldn't tell you exactly precisely why that is. And then we get this thing about the draws, that the draws are better bets here, and then they're worse bets here. So um, so that's a prediction that comes specifically from this disagreement-based uh, 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 structure um, that we put in, and, and that it doesn't seem to reflect just that people who uh, uh, like long shot bets are just less elastic. Okay. Um, here's the evidence that we that we developed for the uh, um, on loss rates for the Asian handicap market. Now, it's a little trickier to figure out what the sort of exit. We're, we're, we're just using normalized probabilities here to sort of rank bets by how likely they are to win. Uh, it's a little trickier for the Asian handicap market. Because a bit of an analogy to to home away and draw, the bets generally have three outcomes: the, you, your bet on home can win, your bet on away can win, or you get a refund. So one of the things we did in our earlier empirical paper was basically come up with a methodology for estimating the probability of a refund, and then backing out the probabilities of wins on either side. Uh, 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 given that, so we're still able to sort the data by the ex-ante probability of a win, and loss rates are essentially flat relative to that. Um, now, when we started that project, I thought that because there's a handicap, that the handicap would always just even up the, the two teams, and so the, it would just be like that the, we'd, we'd get this very narrow range of, of probabilities of wins. Um, but actually, we get quite a decent range going from about 0.25 up to 0.55. Uh, that's clearly not as wide a range as we see from home away draw betting. Right? There's, no, there's not going to be any 70 percenters or 80 percenters out here because when City play Sheffield, Sheffield are going to get you know two and a half goals. Um, but there's, there's enough range here to say that we can see that within that range, the home away draw market has uh, a substantial favorite long shot bias. And this, this doesn't seem to. OK, that is pretty much all that I had to say about the paper. I'll maybe try to anticipate a couple of comments uh, and give sort of pithy answers, and then we, we can explore more of them if people, people want to want, want to ask. So, so one question I get sometimes is, well, shouldn't the betters be risk averse, right? They clearly don't have to be risk lovers in, in this framework because they might dislike risk, but their, their P tilde is so skewed that they take the bet despite the risk that's involved because the expected return is so high. Um, so we could model that. Um, the bit of modeling I've done of this with, with, with competitive markets has showed that generally speaking, if you have realistic levels of literature that people use for the kind of big decisions that people take, like in insurance or whatever, that people have log utility, um, you just get very, very little betting. And I, I think more generally, there's a, there's a very convincing argument from Matt Rabin in his uh, Conometrica paper in 2000 that um, if people are going to be realistically risk averse so that we can explain decisions they make in terms of the stock market and all these kinds of things, then they, they re people really shouldn't be risk averse on low stakes bets, right? That, that people should effectively be risk neutral. 
on low stakes bets. If your risk aversion shows up that you're turning down 50 50s for, you know, win nine, lose seven, uh, then it turns out you'll be so risk averse, like, you, you know, you'd barely cross the street because uh, uh, you'd be, be too risky. Bookmakers, on the other hand, could be risk averse. And we have looked into this. Essentially, this chart comes out the exact same if we make the bookmaker uh, uh, risk averse. Um, it changes the competitive model uh, because the competitive model, now they have to think about the variance of their profits, not just the expected return. And bets that they offer on long shots of higher variance than bets that they offer on favorites. And so they care about the volumes now. So uh, once upon a time, this was part of this paper, but the paper ended up being a 60 page monster. So I have a separate paper that looks at that. And effectively, this turns out to be another reason why you may get favorite long shot bias, that even competitive uh, uh, markets may settle on discriminating against long shots because, the, because they don't like the thing that they're maximizing is not just expected profits, but it's expected profits adjusted for risk and the market settles down on, on discriminating against long shots. So that may be part of what's going on here, that, that, that the, 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 the sharp bookmakers are not worrying that much about risk, um, whereas the, 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 the soft bookmakers are. Um, why are people not betting in the Asian handicap market is a question I get. I'm guessing you guys know uh, uh, um, more than other people have presented this out, but we, we know the sharp operators, they have small profit margins, they're very averse to tax, and so they tend to be offshore. They're not licensed, and they don't have a retail presence in most places. So a lot of people have just have just never heard of them. They also maintain a nice business, I believe, selling probabilities and analytics to 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 retail bookmakers, and uh, that that who you know don't necessarily uh, um, uh, mess up that uh, uh, that apple cart. Um, the obvious question from the whole literature on favorite long shot bias is when you see the odds and you see that your guy is a long shot and you didn't realize that you thought he was a favorite, why don't they change their mind? I guess ultimately, you know, people bet because they disagree with each other and just people take bets sometimes because they think they know better than 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 the bookmakers. Um, so, I mean, one could always change the model. Could, you know, people like uh, uh, Peter Sorensen and Marco Tiviani will all, often all, always stress that, OK, people have some prior and then they see the, the odds and they incorporate that information and then ex post they've got a posterior distribution and all of that. Um, but uh, I didn't feel like writing down fancy theory like that. Uh, ultimately, people disagree and that's why they take different positions. So that's all I have prepared. So. Very happy to take questions on on this or, or or anything else that's related. Great, thank you very much, Carl. I am going to give you a Teams round of applause. It should appear on your screen. Uh, really interesting talk, uh, and we've got plenty of time for questions and comments. So, if anyone has any questions and comments they want to make, please uh, do raise your hand. One thing I could say is Tig, Tig might have something he wants to say to clarify or uh, improve on what I've said, or if there's anything else that comes in, he's, he's very welcome to, to speak for us at this point as well. Yeah, now if anybody has any questions related to the um, bookmaking market, um, from my perspective of being a bookmaker, welcome, happy to answer any questions. But I think you've done a good job, Carl, on um, Thanks. the case there. So questions and comments. I guess one one I'll ask you is like, you know, not, you know, I kind of, I don't really bet myself. I've done a little bit of research in the area, but I tend to rely on my co-authors for more of the theoretical insights and tend to just crunch the numbers myself. Um, but one thing you mentioned in your model, you had um, you know, a competitive scenario and a monopolist scenario. Um, yeah. Do you are you able to through that get any sense of you know, how competitive these markets actually are? I mean, you mentioned that the kind of the home draw way is very competitive in the Asian handicap. Um, sorry, the other way around, even. Um, yeah, yeah. 
you can play and can you get a sense over time whether the market's becoming more or less competitive so so we can see it so and look we can you can calculate margins if, from 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 the from the data i don't think the handicap market in the time series that we have i don't think its competitiveness has changed i think i'm correct Tig, that 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 the the retail home away draw market has become a little bit more competitive uh, yes. over the course of the data set. Yeah, and there's also some studies which have also shown that that the um, margins have come down over time in the retail market. And I think that's the case there, but it, it isn't it isn't drastic. We didn't run any statistical tests or anything, um, but yeah, margins have come down over the years. But the Asian handicap for the most part remains flat because the margin is so low as it is that you, you know it couldn't really go any lower, given that they have to have some fixed costs. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, one of the parameters that we have to write down in this model is what is the cost, you know, per dollar a bet. Um, and we have it set quite low at 2%. And I would have started the project writing down bigger numbers. But then if those numbers, if those bigger numbers are true, then the, then there's no profit to be made by the sharp bookmakers on Asian handicap betting. So it must be. That the cost per bed is lower, um, but th there's there's an issue there, which is the cost per bed for the Asian handicap guys is based on the research and uh, uh, that that they're doing. The cost per bet for retail bookmakers incorporates marketing and tracking, customer profiling, and all of that sort of stuff. So, um, but. But getting information on how much they the, the the accounts are not very forthcoming on uh, on their costs. <laughs> <coughs> Great, thanks. Any questions and comments from others? Stefan. So. Thanks, Carl. That was a really, it was a really great presentation and, and very interesting. And and I, you know, I love these. Just, I mean, it seems like a very simple idea about the, how this works. It's very elegant, very simple. But I did have one. It did make me think. Um, it seemed to me, if I understood, and I might might have got this wrong, but if I understood the monopoly argument, that effectively the favorite long term bias emerges as really a function of arithmetic. It's really the absolute difference in the beliefs can be the same, and that same absolute difference leads to different behavior. Yeah. But as you said at the beginning, I mean, there's not really much of a behavioral story in this. And one thing just struck me that couldn't I fix that by just taking logarithms? If the logarithm of the difference rather than the absolute difference was what mattered, then haven't I just got rid of the, the the effect and why should it be the absolute rather than the log of the difference that, that matters in this? Yeah, no, that's a good that's a great observation. And in fact, you probably explained the mechanism better than I did. I just used numbers and threw it out there. Um, so, I mean, this is always a this has been a, a an issue in terms of, of of specifying people's beliefs going back to like the early days of Bayesian Bayesian statistics, right? You know, how how do I express a uniform prior? How do I how do I how do I say that I know nothing, right? So you know, <laughs> if x if if x is between zero and one, does does a uniform distribution mean that I I know nothing about about x? Okay, but then one over x, it turns out you've actually made a really strong statement about one over x. Did you know anything about one over x? No, I don't know anything about one over x. Um, <laughs> so 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 it's tricky. To sort of settle on on what people's beliefs should be, so I think ultimately it's probably intuitive that if people are thinking about a, a, a probability, that that's the calculation people are doing, right? I think this team is X percent likely to win. That the disagreement structure is some people think it's a bit higher, some people think it's a bit lower, but but of of course if the disagreements are skewed in certain ways, they'd have to be skewed in a very specific way to to not get this result. Um, but but ultimately, I, I guess we're happy with that the that the evidence seemed to come out consistent with with this with this theory. Um, 
the day I saw that chart, I went, people are going to think I'm I'm data mining this. We need to be very, very open about uh, the, the data availability and the programs and all of this because it it looked a bit too good to be true. But but th that's exactly it. It's the, the absolute values of, of 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 the disagreements relative to the underlying probability are bigger for uh, um, for long shots than they are for fav for favorites. Yeah, um, I tell people when I when I do the grandmother version of this, right? I say the true probability is 0.9. So. Uh, but there's somebody out there that thinks it's 0.8. So, you know, it's Man City versus Sheffield United. Sheffield United are 0.1. There's somebody out there that thinks it's 0.2 and they'll take five to one and or decimal odds of five and they shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> and there's other issues, which is, you know, if somebody was a systematic long shot better, they should notice the pattern. So we kind of have to assume here that when people disagree that it's you're randomly assigned incorrectness is not correlated um but yeah no that's a, that, that 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 that's a great point okay, thanks stefan any more questions and comments I'll say one thing because I got this in a referee's report when this paper got rejected last week, <laughs> which which is, and I don't know if, if this reflects badly on the model or, or or how to think about it. One thing I didn't highlight when presenting the model is uh, the home away draw model. Some people will bet on two outcomes. Right? People take any bets that are positive expected value. So it turns out there's a bunch of people who are sort of in the middle of the distribution and they'd be willing to bet on a home win and a draw. And a referee at a recent journal said this was the fatal flaw of the paper. But I, I'm, I was missing a bit how it was a fatal flaw because in the real world, you can bet on two or three outcomes that actually is legal and allowable. But I guess you get into issues of the expected return on the two bets won't be equal. Maybe if you have two dollars to bet, you put it on the highest expected return. Uh, well, so it sent me looking at I haven't emphasized the quantities in the model at all. And one reason I don't emphasize the quantities, is we don't have data on the quantities. But I will note that in the home away draw model, at the equilibrium prices that the bookmakers charge, very few people bet on draws. Um, so which I think matches what we think the truth is. Um, I think there's some data on this, um, even down to I think there was a recent paper by very possibly some people in the room showing that even when the draw becomes the more likely outcome when you do real time betting, uh, it's still not the thing that most people bet on because people don't don't like to bet on draws. Now that if there's no draw betting aversion in our model, but the quantities that it generates are it seem to be consistent with the reality that people don't. So it turns out very few people, people in the model can bet on two outcomes, but it turns out very few do. Kind of related to that, um, something that Carl and I have sometimes talked about in the past is to what extent, because obviously, you know, whenever we think about these kinds of bets, we think about them in isolation as if this football match took place and there were no other football matches taking place at the same time. Whereas I imagine people have placed bets, they're placing bets. You know, if, it, if it's not actual accumulated, then you know they're placing a bet on this game and maybe somehow in some weird way offsetting it with a bet in a different game. You know, to what extent does that, can that you know, have any kind of in, interaction with your model, the fact that there's multiple games at the same time? I think as long as, long as the outcomes are uncorrelated, uh, then, it, then it doesn't then it doesn't matter. Um, it does affect, and this is one reason why I took modeling bookmaker risk aversion out of things, is it does make modeling of bookmakers being risk averse more complicated, right? And as some, if people are interested in this, there's some discussion of this in the, uh, the other paper that I have that's on my website, for, uh, forthcoming Economica, which is, yeah, you, you could model a bookmaker on match by match how much risk are they taking on the on each on the each match? But of course, in the aggregate, it's it's a lot of it kind of you know averages and washes out. But 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 
in the paper that I did, I just, I just, uh, with the competitive bookmaker being risk averse, we do just model it match by match. And then and the argument I made was that ultimately, uh, you know, risk is sort of granular, right? So uh, if we look at the risk in a portfolio of matches, then if I take a more risky approach at the individual game level, that's going to aggregate up. If they're uncorrelated, the simple formulas for aggregating that up. But ultimately, the match by match risk is what's it's what's going to aggregate up. Um, now, I've, it does raise questions whether or not the scale of the business that some bookmakers do is it such that you just sort of say, well, there basically is no risk, right? It's it's and and perhaps that's how the likes of Pinnacle view their business, right? Um, we just take such enormous quantities at these low margins, and we just don't have to worry worry about that. Um, I, I, I've looked into this a little bit. Um, like for example, the the Nevada State you know Gaming Board actually re reports the monthly profits of the sports books, the Vegas sports books. Um, they don't actually make a profit every month. Uh, sometimes they lose. So. You know, some big favorite comes in or something. Um, if you read the, the the nice book, Aaron Rogan's book on Paddy Power, uh, Punters, describes how like every so often Paddy Power have a really bad week, and it's usually, you know, all the favorites won at Ascot or or, or, or Cheltenham or something like that. Um, so so I, so it seems like some bookmakers may be at a scale where that it all balances out, while while others are not. Mm. I'm, open to, I'm open to collaborating with anybody on risk in bookmaking as a thing because I think we'd I think we'd like to see more be interesting to see more papers about that. Open invitation there. Questions and comments. On the data you mentioned that um you know if you look at odds checker and you took the data from odds checker those aren't the actual odds no. um but the football data presumably the the chap who puts it all together he's also doing some kind of similar operation to what odds checker does and he's scraping the information from each bookmaker is the, is the same presumably the same critique applies there in terms of the prices that you've got does that matter yeah i mean it's i guess that's what he's taking an average so um but he some researchers have used the he also makes best price available mm. Uh, mm. in the data set and that has been used in some studies but uh tig warned me on pain of death that we can't use that uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not real right no, tig? <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the bookmakers actually have to pay to um, appear on Odds Checker, um, mm. so it's it's something I like, guess it's 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 quite substantial the amount they pay. So yeah, so as I was saying, that a lot of uh, some people don't know that if you click on Odds Checker, that the bookmaker will track that you came in from Odds Checker. So obviously that can go into your profile then that you were an initial customer of Odds Checker. So then they can monitor you further after that and see betting behavior. So if you're continuously, you know, only that's our standout best they know that so look the prices exist in, in so far as you can see them on odds checker but the reality of actually placing a, way, a wager of any substance on them you know it, it's not really there um, the, the, the somewhat trickier issue for us was that um the the asian handicap uh, uh joe has in like there's that there is a single asian handicap and the average odds at that handicap but in practice if you, you can go to Pinnacle and they'll quote you like four different values of the handicap and four different sets of odds. So um, so we had communication with him about this and he basically said he picked, you know, the most popular, what seemed to be the most popular handicap. Um, so, um, so that's something we've looked at. Uh, we have another paper that uses multiple different Asian handicaps on the same games to see mm. to see how they behave. Um, 
And we, we we know that there is an interesting pattern in that, which is after big upping the Asian handicap as this amazing efficient betting market, um, it actually turns out average loss rates on Asian handicaps differ across the different kind of handicaps that they offer. So, you, so you're more likely to lose money if you take the the, the a half goal handicap because there's no refund. Mm. Um, whereas the ones with refunds, you lose less on. Now, mm. in theory, in a sort of efficient markets kind of way, that should wash out. Um, but it seems in practice it doesn't, which I think is particularly surprising given that our idealized version of the Asian handicap that we've kind of sold to here is it's full of guys like Tony Bloom, right? Uh, who can who can do addition? <laughs> <coughs> okay, still got plenty of time for questions and comments. If anyone has any. Okay, well, I'm going to take that as a no, uh, and we can wrap up. And uh, so, thank you very much, Carl and Tag. Uh, really interesting work, uh, and um, wish you uh, all the best as you um, follow on from that unfortunate rejection. Sorry to hear about that. <laughs> Not to worry. I, didn't with it. I didn't review. It. I think I might. It's, it's possible I was asked to, but I think I declined to review um, your paper. <laughs> Which would be good for you because you'd still be waiting by now for. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's it's uh, it's all water off a duck's back at this stage. <laughs> so yeah, wish okay. You all the best Listen, now. thanks, James, for the invite. It was great fun. No worries. We'll be back next week. Uh, next week we're gonna have uh, Federico Fioravanti from the University of Amsterdam presenting visitors out the absence of away team supporters as a source of home advantage in football. Uh, and I will wish you all a fantastic weekend and see you all hopefully sometime soon. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Carl. Thanks, James. Thanks, Ty.